how is that everyone anyway? Hello, guys. Hello. So, how how are you guys finding the like uh, homework and collab notebooks? Have you been able to finish it? the one zero one and this homework i think the homework was uh from the 2019 session and it is using a lot of snaps someone was also mentioning that on the slack also um i did like homework zero with network x instead of snap um i i tried using snap like two years ago but it was just more convenient using networks because it's like a normal common library. And if you like stack, stack overflow is, um, you're more likely to find answers to what you're looking for. Yeah. So yeah, even for me, uh, I have uh, done collab uh, zero and uh, almost first one is done, but then I haven't touched the homework one. So I was wondering whether I should approach it using snap or using a network network. So I guess I would rather use Network X because I know it better than Snap, definitely. I think kind of um, because like homework zero is more kind of getting familiar with libraries, and I think um, for like projects outside of um, this course, I think kind of using Network X is probably going to be easier. So I just uh, yeah, went totally. Network X. Yeah, so also, as you mentioned, like, uh, there's a lot of information on the Slack also, if you don't understand something. Uh, even the code is easier to follow. Uh, uh, yeah, so someone was mentioning on Slack, as I was saying, like, that it is a very, uh, like, similar to C, I would rather stick to uh, uh, this Network X only. Yeah, Network X seems a bit more Pythonic. Snap is faster, I believe, right? And it would be... Right. For very large graphs, you mean? Yes. yes. Right. Yeah, I mean, kind of, I would expect a snap. I mean, snap, I think they rolled it for it to get, like, it's because I think there's like the C port and the Python port. So we expect it to be faster than network X. But I think with like rapids, uh, having the like Q graph library, I don't. Uh, well, I think the Q graph I haven't used it myself. I think the API is quite similar to Network X, so I suspect that if you need larger graphs, you're probably better off just jumping directly to Q graph rather than um going through it now. But I mean, obviously, I haven't tried it myself, so I can't really say for sure. From what I understand, uh, you know, the API is like hundred percent. Uh, compatible, but uh, installing Rapids is a pain. So that's that's what I got from somebody else who did this. Uh, but I haven't done it myself here. So again, yeah, second hand information. I mean, kind of, I tried. I mean, it was a while ago, but I think maybe like half a year ago, I installed QDF and QML and yes. have yeah. and I play around with it a bit. Didn't really do anything serious, but it was fairly straightforward to install. But I guess okay. Okay. it, I mean, with these things, is sometimes a bit <laughs> a mystery yeah. on it. Um, if, if it's more than an import function, I'm count me out. I like I, import, import library done for learning. I managed to install the wrong snap to get started with. I'm not sure if I see anyone. <laughs> Pip install snap. It's not snap Stanford. So almost as easy then. Yeah. All right. I plan to just use uh, network X personally. I just, I can only have one thing in my mind so, during learning. Now the implementations and uh, timing and performance, that's a different um, aspect of, of this. <clears throat> Yeah, that's that, a good way to think about it. Not that I did the homework, so. Yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of input and output formats, I was actually trying to visualize stuff with uh, 
uh, with like client side libraries like um, D3 or stuff like that. Uh, I was looking at the, I haven't dug too far into the Snap library so far, but I'm not sure what formats it imports and exports. It seemed Network X had a little bit more ability to kind of dump the graph out into all kinds of formats that you could use, even like, uh, I don't know, people have come across uh, Cyto, Cytoscape, which is like a client-side JavaScript library for, for walking through graphs and stuff. It had formats for that and a few other things. Um, so far, I mean, I've, I've only played with Snap like the last 15 minutes, but uh, it seems to rely on, was it GNU plot? things like that, fairly low level libraries for doing its visualization. I haven't actually come across all of the uh, the formats it can output too much yet. Maybe it's more like for low level kind of ana analysis of graph with like ad adjacency matrices and stuff like that. Not sure, not sure where the yeah, course goes me. with visualization. Right, Yeah. right, right. I mean, my impression is that the course doesn't really focus that much on visualization. It's more kind of how we do right. um, like downstream ML tasks on a problem Sorry. representation that is graph. Yeah. Has anyone dug into these different generators? Like I, I've seen this uh, forest fire um, algorithm mentioned a few times. What? What is that compared to other types of uh, generators? Uh, generates a random. I'm just wondering. So it says generates a random forest fire with given prob probabilities. What what is uh what are the properties of a forest fire type of graph when generated compared to other types of graphs? I don't know if anyone's come across that. Uh, Every, so, so like which, uh, which lecture mentions that? I, I can't recall anything in this. Oh, I'm, I'm just looking through the docs on Snap. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I have sleep. I'm not looking at the lecture too much yet. Just going through all the different pay, all the different features of the library. I was actually looking at ways to manipulate the graphs. So once you've got a whole bunch of data, can you use some of the functions in here to reduce the graph to like a simpler graph or just, you know, I think it, it does a lot of stuff for like finding clusters and finding groups of nodes that are more connected. That's kind yeah, of the power, like power of- yeah. Subgraph, you can, as far as I'm, I'm completely ignorant about most of these things, but just poking into network X, it looks like, you can make a subgraph from any node, which must cut off part of the of the graph. So I'm sure yeah. there's all sorts of properties, parameters, and methods. Yeah. For determining what's in your graph. Um, right. Like only ones that are within four nodes or four hops, things like that. I'm sure. Right. Right. Let's build one if there's not. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to convert a kind of a complex network graph into just like a tree graph just uh -huh. for um, removing any cycles, but I couldn't really see a way to do that. I'm not sure if that's a common thing that people try to do with graphs. Interesting, like um, a, a non-tree into a tree, given some yeah, exactly. criteria. Yeah, just get rid of any kind of loopbacks so that it becomes easier to kind of go from the beginning to the end kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe you could even flatten loopbacks. I don't know, like if it went A, B, C, D, you then rename D as like E. So even though you're kind oh, of deduping de it in a way, yeah. Right, right. I think it's like a, 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 um, so but, called a, self, a self graph, just, just remove it, erase it, make it go away. Yeah, you could even just delete the loops. Yeah, but then you do lose a little bit, bit of information. Oh, yeah, you could spread them across all of the other neighbors evenly right. or something. Right. You could yeah. use an auto encoder. So if you were to use like a convolutional graph or a graph convolutional network, you can use mm -hmm. some kind of auto encoder to probably shrink it down on the other side. Um, I've never done it, but it's probably possible. Hmm. So like the input of the final layer of the, of the um, 
the the encoder how, how, how does that actually work does it just throw away information or it's approximating or i would say um, obviously it would depend on what your target is and what kind of data you have available yeah um yeah. but you could go through and create some kind of cleaned uh data set where you've manually gone through and replaced things that you don't want in there and then when you go to train an auto encoder it might be able to mimic it just throwing an idea out there i've never actually done that but mm. it seems like a mm. possibility it would, learn, it would learn how to redistribute those things or something. That's yeah, and generate the. It probably it wouldn't be like trimming per se. It'd be more generating a new simpler model. Mm -hmm. Under how you would can it impose the constraint? Congrats, sorry. Yeah. So how how would it know the difference between a a looping node versus any other node by the time it it gets past well, I mean, that all, data through? It, all it's doing is trying to capture the information necessary in the latent space and then regenerate it. And if you have like kind of the output where it's not like, like you don't have this, the input and output be the same during training, right? You'd have like the mm -hmm. manual stuff on the outside. So then it would go through it capture the information in the latent variables and then uh, generate a new graph based on uh, the information that's being passed through the latent space. Hmm. Like during, during training, it would actually reduce one of the nodes to nothing or whatever. However, it's represented, it would learn that that's no longer in the output and it would figure out to not have it in the output. Yeah, it's just an idea. I, I've never actually done it. It's just something that came to mind. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't like the latest famous representation be that each node will actually map to something you don't actually throw it away? It's just transform into a more compact space. Yeah, but it's more just like trying to capture the information. So it takes the graphs that it has, puts it down into latent variables, and then it from there, it generates a new model. And the new model is based on the modified uh, graph training data. So I mean, it, the, the data would still be there and all the information about the graph would still be there. It's just like it's knows to generate something different. Uh, yeah. The information that, it has. that that new representation may not meet his criteria. That's like I don't know what the output criteria is. That maybe it has to be displayable in a flat space or something or yeah something like that. Yeah. I'm trying to plot stuff in using a there's a sand a, a type of diagram called a Sankey graph, which is kind of like a flow chart going left mm -hmm. to right. And it, it goes haywire That's when you have loops, basically. Right. So it's a 2D uh -huh. graph. Yeah, exactly. And it can't represent anything in that third dimension, which might be a... Or, or it just can't represent... If, if it's plotting left to right, it can't suddenly flip and go right to left. It gets oh. confused. And it, it, it kind of just gets... It goes nuts in a kind of recursive... Mm. Uh, problem if two nodes kind of, or, or if a sequence, of, if it goes A, B, C, D, A, uh, like that throws uh, the algorithm off basically for uh, calculating that's the parts. Sounds like an interesting little project that <laughs> does, I mean, it, it sounds we're talking about it and the fact that we can actually talk about it and comprehend the words means it's more possible than some things. Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems a good application of this kind of graph analysis libraries that are uh, available, but you have to know what, yeah. what functions to look for, I guess. Oh yeah, you gotta, gotta know what, what's going on. That's what we're trying to do is learn what's going on with uh, hey, right. <laughs> new tools to put in the toolbox. But the approach of using like a training, like training it on graphs, wouldn't, wouldn't you need some data that had already been trained in that way in order okay. to teach and that's what Andrew, Andrew said, Andrew, Andrew, Andrew said you would, you would represent it somehow. You would have to actually do the training. Right. You know, the, you'd have to create labeled truth. Well, no. The idea of an autoencoder is that the, basically your input and output is just the same thing, but you kind of like you shrink your shrink you shrink your input graph down into the latent space, and then you expand latent space out into the the same um, output again. So kind of so. So basically, you uh, the training is basically comparing the output of the decoder versus the input to the to the encoder. 
No. So you don't actually need labels. You just it's like you just train yeah. it on. Thing. That, that's that's a vanilla vanilla auto encoder. Like all auto encoders don't necessarily have to reconstruct on the other end the exact same thing. You can use different things. Um, it's kind of like if you were to do like a GAN or something, right? You it's pretty much just the inverse auto encoder. So you can play around a lot with um, the general structure of an auto encoder to do some pretty crazy things. So the output doesn't have to be exactly the same. You can have custom input and output that are different. How, how do you know what latent space is? I thought latent space was kind of that stuff that we really don't know what they are. We just know that they are. Well, that's the thing, right? So you have on your encoder is encoding whatever graphs that you have into the latent variables, trying to capture the information in that graph. And then if you have labeled output, the decoder will train to take that latent space information, which yeah, I mean, it's just a vector that you don't really know what's, what's in there, but you can have the decoder know that it needs to take that type of information and produce the type of graph he's looking for. I see. But don't you need an example of the, the results that you're looking for to tell it? Yeah, that's what I was saying. You probably have to go through and do some manual stuff. Um, so right. some manual labeling and modification, but yeah. then there are kind of techniques. Um, I'm not something I'd have to really think about, but you could probably do some kind of few shot um, training on mm -hmm. the decoder um, that would make it so you don't have to have a ton of label data. Yeah. Like you would like, those... you train the auto encoder first and then yeah. you would update some of the weights with the modified data set. Hmm. And can you use that technique? Like, let's say if I manually labeled something with like, I don't know, 50, 50 nodes in it and I went through and, you know, I bought it to take out all of the loops. And then you can apply that same model on something with, you know, tens of thousands of, of nodes. Do you think, does it work like that? So you're, um, you're scaling at a much different scale. Or you're, so you're I, kind of at, I kind of looked ahead training. at the, the yeah. I kind of looked ahead at in the, this course and yeah. it looks like, yes, that might be possible to do with the convolu uh, graph convolutional uh, network uh, features because it right. is able to, the way that it constructs is it looks like two nodes deep or something and then kind of backtracks and reconstructs stuff. So it can right. work with things that it hasn't seen before and it can mm -hmm. uh, work on the pattern. So it's possible, like I said, I haven't done it. So it yeah. just, like have to probably spend a week. So on. You're, you're just kind of giving it the behavior you want, but on a very, very small subset and then having it scale that same behavior yeah. up in theory. That's what I would think would work. Just, I'm not sure about the implementation. I'm sure there'd be some, some mm. <laughs> learning <laughs> along the way. Right, right. I believe take a distribution over the latent space. So kind of like variation of what encoders? There's perhaps something like that. Sorry? So, yeah. so maybe you have a sample of 50. Um, you have some prior knowledge of how your data will be distributed, and you take like a prior over it, usually a Gaussian. So I think mm -hmm. that's the same idea. For a variational autoencoder? I mean, that would give you kind of some stochasticity where you'd have mm -hmm. like some random output kind of generated. It would look similar, but it probably wouldn't be solid as with a graph, it feels like you'd probably want some stability in there, some more, uh, I don't know, deterministic or <laughs> something a little bit more clean cut, but who knows? It could work. With the uh, SNAP library, um, can you add weights? I was looking, I mean, the, the few simple examples that I saw just seemed to be a collection of nodes and edges. I didn't really see how you could add weight on an edge. Yeah, it's maybe I need to dig into the API a bit more. If the network um, access just an attribute, every node has an ad, every edge has an attribute. And right. That's all it is, I think. Also in yeah. the adjacency matrix, you can just have it as opposed to being like zeros and ones, you can change the, the uh, value uh, in the adjacency matrix. So, Interesting rate for a specific edge. Interesting. I thought the adjacency matrix was more for encoding the nodes. So it's it's encoding the connections between nodes. It's, yeah. So it rows, and rows and columns yeah. are the nodes. So in directed one, you can have a direction. In an undirected one, what I understand is you can have zero one, basically telling you uh, all nodes have uh, like 
equal weighting so as you mentioned like an agency matrix you can give weights to individual uh, non zero values yeah so yeah it is mapping the edges between the nodes got it got it so like xy34 refers to the connection between nodes 3 and nodes 4 correct got it okay so each edge is just corresponds to one um one square on the on the grid basically it's not kind of averaging two like if you put two values in two different squares they would absolutely map just onto one edge each there's no kind of interpolation between sizes or anything like that so if you is there any way that you can encode the property of the node like let's say i'm i'm trying to plot a web page um thing where each node is a page and each um edge is uh traffic going between those two pages can you plot the size of a page like yeah. you know something nodes like have, that can you encode that in a 2d nodes have properties matrix? nodes have yeah. properties you can just define whatever the property is Yeah. yeah so th- so that would be relevant to agency matrix what i understand the the properties of the nodes and maybe it would be something like a index of index and the like column index mm-hmm. of that agency matrix yeah uh, but the what the values in the agency matrix would refer to the uh, as you were mentioning traffic going between those pages so yeah. if there's a if the, if the, for two nodes there's a traffic is very i mean there's a lot of traffic then we'll have a much higher value there Yeah, and yeah. If there are like two nodes, uh, and if there are two pages with not at all, not there is no traffic between them, then I would say it will be very close to zero, something like yeah. that. Yeah. No, I can understand that, but I can't understand how you can encode the data of both of them in one two D array, uh, unless yeah, you, you have it. like a three D array or it's a yeah, unique extra thing. dimension. Right. Nodes, okay. nodes and edge, nodes and edges are much different things. They're not. I, yeah. I think you're trying to reduce it into one thing. Yeah. <clears throat> in sense, so. Well, I. But if you just had basically an X Y Z kind of cube of of coordinates, the the direction looking back on the Z could be the node properties, mm-hmm. yep. and then and then you only have one kind of data structure that you have to manipulate to do everything with, as opposed to having to like have like two tables effectively. Oh, you're trying to do the mapping into this thing that might be uh, for the display or something. I see. Yeah, that, that's well, yeah, graph. but. Yeah. Th- that's where graph neural networks come in, right? I mean, where you not only take uh, the information about the edges, but also about the properties of the nodes. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. So yeah. But I mean, trying to figure out what's going on in a neural network always seems a bit of a losing battle compared to just like here's a cube of numbers, and I can like drill into this um to this dimension, and I can find out what's happening. to the, the different nodes just by like slicing through the um that that property you know it's the yeah. the black box or the the opposite of a black box approach basically if you want to manipulate for example a uh, a certain path through the network and you want to highlight that path or something i mean good luck doing that in a neural network yeah. Yeah. Well, the, 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 i think you're conflating the concept of a neural network and a graph network right right fair yeah. enough graph network is graph network just the graph it has nodes it has edges each node yeah. has properties each edge has properties yeah yeah neural But networks what's... are are approaches to solving some optimization problems right right okay yeah, yeah. but what's the data structure that is is used to kind of in a really compact way visualize all those properties of the graph like the adjacency matrix seems like a really kind of neat hack for for um encoding the data in edges mm. but then how do you come up with a similar way of of encoding edges and nodes in one very compact mm. or one very easy to to kind of apply transformations to type yeah. of data structure um in traditional graph manipulations you would message pass right so you would have okay. um you know node properties and yeah. you you would have so you would you know pass messages from one node with mm-hmm. some function of its properties to all its neighbors right and okay. maybe the amount of message that you pass is filtered by how much you know how big the edge is or how you know how much weight the edge has yeah right so 
you could you could factor in these things but in a very crude you know manual way i think it's not really yeah. you know the hands off neural network kind of deal yeah. right but then you're effectively got a whole bunch of objects that represent the properties of each node and you're effectively just calling uh functions on these things that just iterate through yes. and iterate through with messages yeah. and stuff whereas if you did have one huge matrix then you could apply a calculation to the whole graph in one one pass basically in theory to to some extent I, though it is you know it's a matrix multiplication right so every time yeah. you message pass on one right. edge right to your all your mm -hmm. neighbors immediate neighbors mm -hmm. It's yeah. like one multiplication, one matrix operation. Right. And right. you yeah. repeat the operation one more time, you go to the next yeah. numbers, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Right, right, right. Oh yeah, you'd have in, you'd have you'd have outbound and inbound coming back towards you again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, yeah, it's cool. I can't wait to learn about message message. What's it? Message bus kind of message informing. passing. Message yeah. passing. Okay. Is that part of the uh, one of the lessons coming up? Not sure. This I learned this when I was doing uh, what's his name, uh, the the graph, the Hadoop think, equivalent of graphs, whatever that was. Uh, well, I think there's some discussion of that when they talk yeah. about page rank later in the course. Like, okay, yeah. to calculate page uh -huh. rank, you just basically start off with a random page and give it a random value, and then just keep walking till you get to the end of the web. I mean, pretty much message passing is one of the core ideas of graph neural nets, as in like. <laughs> how you do the message passing and how you construct um, that over the convolution. So they'll definitely go into it in more detail in like... I see, I see. Did you so, have to... like, uh, is this message passing very similar to the thing which you, he was mentioning in page rank, like that Markov tape uh, matrices he had and he was multiplying it again and again uh, till he gets some stable values for the page rank importances. It sounds familiar, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or at least it sounds like it would make sense there, where you have to inform other nodes about neighboring nodes' properties. That um, I'm sure it's coming up because you would have to. There's no way to make the information be available to other nodes. I think kind of you, like last year we were talking about the color refinement. Exactly. It's pretty much uh, more or less along those lines. Yeah. yeah, 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 I would say. So he starts with some random initial colors and then basically moves to some final one till it stabilizes. I think we had a discussion last time also, like what is the number of iterations uh, in which one should go through before settling on some uh, values of those colors. But yeah, I think I forgot to uh, check like how many number of iterations or what is the stopping criteria there. But at least for uh, the uh, the the page rank uh, algorithm, it uh, tells you that uh, once you reach a stable state of a uh, uh, stable, once you reach a stable state, you can basically uh, think it at, in terms of like eigenvectors and solve it without even Im uh, simulating the whole thing uh, completely. Cool. I'm sure we'll get there. Yeah, and message passing is very integral to graphs. And so the, the, the toolkit I was thinking of is Pregel, which was like, you know, Hadoop for graphs, basically, like this is before Spark, before. Uh, and uh, subse successive uh, things have adopted this message passing into their uh, frameworks. Mm -hmm. I think it's supposed to be scalable as well. Um, yeah, yeah. In real exactly, application. because of scalability, yeah. If you think about like an IoT network, um, you don't want them to communicate with each other. Like, I mean, that's more scalable than having a large matrix or ingesting that as a large matrix and then performing. Yeah, every node can't know everything about every other node. That's impossible. Mm -hmm. So you have to come up with some some assumptions and some you know stability assumptions or the impact, you know, distant nodes probably don't have as much impact on you. So I don't care about them. Right. Okay. Well, so how did people get on with this week's content? On the last question in the collab one, the encoding, which looks pretty straightforward. 
but I didn't look at the homework. Others? Uh, yeah, I haven't started. I plan to do it this week. I, I didn't actually see a collab linked. I just downloaded, there was like a, a compressed file that just had a very simple right, that's Python HW, document in it. That's HW0. HW1 is the same. Oh, I'm sorry, maybe I'm, okay. Well, that was, I think our intention was to have that at least read and be familiar with right. this week, which I didn't do, but that's the expectation. Uh, and then the collabs are actually from a previous year, 2019. Right. Right. And I think we were just gonna use them to kind of get tooled, tooled up a little bit, get, get into the tooling a little. Uh, so kind of, I think, um... I don't know whether they repeated the collapse or not, but the collapse you can download directly from this year's course. It's the homeworks that you need to download from 2019. Oh, I'm sorry, I had that backwards. Yeah, the homework one, the file there really seems pretty basic. It's just uh, trying out the different APIs mm. for Snap and plotting a couple of things and generating random graphs. You didn't actually see. I think that's homework zero, isn't it? Uh, homework one, I think, unless I got the wrong file. Kind of, I think homework one is a lot more detailed than just playing around with APIs. I mean, like, because the schedule for this week is not, um, we have done or uh, read, read homework zero, not homework one. Oh, you're right. Yeah, there's a whole PDF with a whole bunch of much more complicated questions. Yep. Next week's our our, uh, our easy week, right? Yeah. Okay, catch up week. Yeah. Good. Oh, homework one. Get into it. I guess is again. That's my goal. This is my house right now. Holy ah. mackerel! <laughs> <laughs> Um, so you're busy it's gotten in the way of me getting anything done this week oh man obviously but uh yeah the catch-up week will be really great i'll need it this coming week well homework one isn't due until october 10th so <laughs> when we get into message passing it looks like was the plan to do two weeks? I saw some chatter in the Slack early on. Were you planning to do two weeks per, per week of uh, discussion or is it gonna go pretty much in parallel with the course? It was two sections, you know, for, for uh, two weeks or two sections per week for two weeks and then one section on that third week. And that was a catch up. Right. right. Yeah, that was um, kind of an averaging concession between two weeks and one week to pace it. And the spreadsheet does show uh, just those. Yeah, I see people are in the spreadsheet. So. Joe, bring up the slides um, like last time and then we can and kind of bring up any questions that we had when we're going through them. So Eric, anyone could uh, like make sense of what is a random walk based similarity he was talking about uh, in one of the, I think, uh, third lecture of fourth week, uh, not the fourth, 4.3 lecture. So it was a pretty convoluted formula. I just, uh, I mean, he explained something, but I just basically went over my head. Yeah, intuitively, it's basically, you know, think of what to make, how that works. Right, so uh, essentially you're creating sentences by using these random walks, and then you're running what to pick against that. And basically, so you know, uh, nodes that um, in this new space, if nodes occur close to each other, they are more similar. So, I mean, there, there is obviously the reasoning behind the random walk where it says, you know, if you can reach them, the more times you can reach this particular node from this particular node, the closer they are. Uh, using these random number, you know, random works, but essentially, it's what to vec for graphs. 
Uh, yeah, he's t- so there. Yes, he's talking about some of the negative sampling, then context window size. So, what is the context window size here? Is is like we are limiting our random walk to some specific length? Is that the context window? I'll yeah, share. Yeah. It's it's how far you look for neighbors, right? So if you if you say have a sentence which says A B C D E, right? At point C, do you look all the way to A? or do you look only to b right if you look all the way to a then your window size is like two on this side two on this side so that's like window size of five i think right and so including yourself and whereas if you look just next you know next door neighbors right at c you are only looking at d and b then your window size is three so so is it base, is it uh, controlling how far we are going from the origin node like one step two step or three step uh, similar to the words where we look at three uh like the neighbors which are like three units apart or maybe like third or fourth word that is yes. the context size there if i remember yes ba- so, basically you are defining how similar you want your pairing to be right what is your definition of similarity okay 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 so and and what does it mean by volume of graph i couldn't find uh, like i basically didn't search much but yeah i couldn't understand like what does this mean exactly is anyone uh, like what does this mean intuitively we are summing it up over like twice over i and over j isn't that yeah. just coming over the adjacency matrix yes uh, can you repeat that um like summing over the adjacency matrix yeah right. yeah so that will be the total uh, sum of the all the edges that they are total number of edges yeah total yeah. number of edges yeah. so if we are talking about the like putting weights in agency uh, adjacency uh, sorry uh, adjacency matrix then um, it won't sum it up so are we talking about one zero kind of agency uh, adjacency matrix here right what does the j represent the i is what an intermediate node or something and a j is uh so, what i understand is i are rows and columns yeah exactly yeah. Oh, okay uh, so, so that will be basically number of edges uh without taking the weights into the account of that specific mat- mat- matrix i believe not to vec allows for weighted edges Yeah, If that's I why they correctly. calling about volume or else we could have just written it as a, a number of nodes, total number yes, of nodes, exactly. or total number of degrees. Yeah. So yeah. similar to that. So, so th- that's what base is. Uh, like I was wondering what exactly specific why we are taking it as volume and and like intuitively what is does does this mean this whole thing? Hmm. So, so it's be- kind of like the sum of edges, but with some kind of weight calculation as well. Because it's uh, not just but, whether it's filled or unfilled; it's actually if it has a right. It's not zero. Value, larger it's, value, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So initially, he started with a zero one uh, kind of matrix. So you see all the yeah. values of A are either zero or one. Then it uh, does a uh, matrix factorization here. Basically, mm-hmm. what he says that this is similar to uh, creating these as a, uh, what should I say? Uh, Z as uh, embeddings. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. then he moves here and that will be jumps to this formula i did not go through this this paper i think i should want to try I, i would like to i would uh, try to go through this but then i thought that maybe like if someone has a better idea on this like why uh, we are taking it as volume and then again like so if we are, as uh, sujit was saying that we are it's very similar to what uh, the word to vec does right. uh, maybe i'll just go through the paper and see uh, Uh, what does it mean exactly the individual things i do say that that paper that he linked is not the most easy to read thing okay. usually word to vec when you're doing embeddings and stuff you also have like a reference set so for example you know this word has these vectors this word has these vectors so they that's Were what they, your random they, walks are right <laughs> yeah, okay so your uh, random walk is like a set of um directional vectors that says how these nodes are connected yes so that is specific to your graph right there's no mm-hmm. kind of objective truth like wikipedia word to vec 
word vectors is common against anything written in English. Um, whereas yes. if you're doing graphs, mm -hmm. there isn't really that kind of concept of a reference graph exactly. language. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, I guess this uh, paper is very incomprehensible. It seems too complex. I would rather stick to this. Maybe, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. some modified uh, uh, factorization or agency matrix expression. But this is some kind of formulaic way of encoding like a re repetitive, uh, like almost like an imperative way of walking through a graph and calculating that for every, every node as you step through it. I mean, anything that says walk presumably is going through. Yeah. Okay. Too much. Yeah, yeah. I think that this was so, the one. We yeah, in in some yeah. respects, uh, the matrix factorization approach is similar to mm -hmm. how glove works, right? So okay. glove and word to vec are basically two ways to achieve the same thing. So mm -hmm. with glove, you have this massive uh, co-occurrence matrix of words. And then you try to fact factorize them, right? Mm. Factorize it into uh, two pieces. One that says, okay, here is the similarity between words mm -hmm. because um, you're, you're saying word and word co-occurrence. So essentially, I don't remember the details, but you basically you know, factorize the matrix into a word similarity matrix, which is what you finally want. And uh, mm. you know, something to do with the co-occurrence, right? Whereas with the word to vec, you actually go on a much uh, simpler uh, or less uh, uh, memory intensive operation where you basically say that, okay, I'm going to consider uh, within my window size, I'm going to consider these two uh, words similar. And then I'm going to train my network to predict that these two words are similar, right? And as a side effect of that training, I will get a weight matrix, which is my embedding, right? So here, instead of um, considering sentences, you basically do the random walks and then you say, okay, here is my similar nodes and you do essentially the same thing. So it, it, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, correspondences between the NLP stuff, the embedding stuff. Mm. And mm. This one. one of the things with word um, embeddings, I think you're talking about like co-reference, like being able to replace one word with another. Mm -hmm. um, how can you extract that to graphs because in, in graphs almost every node is is unique in a way they don't have yeah it's, you don't it's see actually, another it's more another like instance similarity, of the right? same word yeah. yeah it's more like similarity even right. even when you talk about what to vec and you have you know two words really close together mm -hmm. you could because of the way the language you know language works you could you know potentially replace one word with another and yeah not lose too much meaning but essentially yeah. all it is, it's all the guarantee that it's giving you that these two words are similar to each other in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but they're similar because the words on either side are yes. the same as in another instance of this of the, the raw data, there's the mm -hmm. same, you know, pair of like, okay. you know, my kingdom for a horse is, is used, like the word kingdom is often sandwiched between my and horse. Mm -hmm. um, and exactly my liege for a horse might also be replaced in the same way. But in a graph, you don't have that kind of reference of a, like a dictionary of words that are being right. used. The, right. the graph nodes are unique instances. Yeah. So I don't More see how you can, yeah. yeah, unless there's some kind of property values that you're also putting on the graph. Like each of the nodes have properties and then you're looking for constructing yeah. some kind of relationships based on those properties. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think he uh, mentioned this, uh, Leskovic, when uh, in three and four, when he introduced right. this uh, embeddings, uh, he basically mm -hmm. said that, okay, the first two uh, lectures we talked about, you know, manually assigning features to nodes. Here mm -hmm. we are going, uh, you know, only on the edges and we say, okay, the right. graph structure is the king and basically mm -hmm. we, you know, assign, right. you know, let it assign, uh, you know, similarity uh, and, and, but Got then it. he goes to, and then he just mentions that in uh, GNNs, when he goes to neural networks, mm -hmm. you can actually take the properties for nodes and the edge information mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. so uh, he's kind of, you know, like evolving, right? The models yeah. are evolving to take more and more things. Into right, right. 
like imagine if you're doing something with molecules, then like you can say, you know, oxygen often comes next to hydrogen and you can mm-hmm. start kind of extrapolating um, what might come next to hydrogen based on similar instances in the past. But if you're just doing a walk through, I'm not sure, like a, you know, a, a network of cities, like the same city doesn't occur in two different places. Right, right. Um, so I guess different algorithms are different, uh, more suitable for analyzing different types of graph content. Right. Also the notion of similarity depends also on your graph, right? So in, in the mm-hmm. case of cities, if you were connecting them by, you know, roads connecting each other, then mm-hmm. the notion of similarity is nearness, right? Physical nearness. Whereas yep. if you were saying that, you know, what kind of cuisine, you know, do they have, right? And you connect yeah. cities with uh, the same kind of cuisine, then the notion mm-hmm. of similarity is, you know, cuisine. Right, nearness, right, right, so, right, right. So like a whole end space between geographical locations right. that both like sushi. Something right. like that. Exactly, yeah. So for the um, the negative uh, sampling that they're using for the uh, node embedding. So, I mean, my interpretation of it is just to get a random, you just sample random batch of nodes from graph. So is that correct? Or do you need to consider that, like I have to ignore like all my neighbors up to GV3 or whatever? Um. I'm not sure. I kind of thought it was the same negative sampling that is used in word to break. Basically, if you know you take random pairs of words and you know assume they're not neighbors, right? And because mm-hmm. most of the English language is that, right? So yeah, but uh, definitely this this might uh, they might have done something smarter here. I, I don't think so. You know. I mean, from the notes, it they don't say that they do anything specific. Just sampling. Mm-hmm. But I just want to check my understanding that I haven't missed mm-hmm. um, anything. I think the sampling was biased towards um, nodes with high degrees. So it wasn't completely random from my understanding, at least. Yes, to some extent, yeah, that's true. I'm yeah, so from, uh, uh, what I'm seeing in this paper uh, is like PN is the product distribution which generates negative sampling and authors have empirically set PN of J uh, uh, like in line with J, I mean that J, sorry, D to the power three by four. So basically like higher the degree, more will be the probability of it getting sampled. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. but that that is true in, you know, uh, for instance, the, right, it's occurring everywhere. So mm-hmm. uh, this will get sampled more. I mean, that's, that's an artifact of the structure, right? So, because they're more significant and important. Yes, right. that's right. But then if your sample is too large, it mentioned about, you know, biasing too much towards those. So they mentioned, I think, uh, is it five to 20 is, is sort of the accepted amount um, for K, for the number of samples you take from a graph. So what, what I think is like uh, that sample window size will be more dictated by your uh, ability to uh, calculate, I mean, the calculation complexity rather than uh, bias, uh, because, uh, uh, so if, if you put everything in, like, uh, if you have a very big negative sample, oh, no, sorry, sorry, yeah, it was talking about context window size. So yeah, no, no I think if I don't have anything to add. Number of negative samples, let me check. So yeah, the, the, so I think there's a bit of a trade-off. So in, in the slides, I made just two considerations. So a, a higher K gives more robust estimates because your, your, your sample size is larger. Uh, although then higher Ks also correspond to higher bias on those negative events. So those high degree nodes. Yep. So in, in practice, you mentioned that K is five to 20, even for really large graphs, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, um, K is the number of negative samples are you talking about? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. And although that seems quite small, you then repeat this many, many times, right? So, um, 
कैसे बात साहब there was one one piece of intuition so you know i've so when doing machine learning models typically you start with classification right so it's kind of beaten into your head that your negative uh, class size and your positive class size must be similar right otherwise it's an unbalanced class and you know you have to do augmentation or you do something else to fix it, right smooth right um so but for search the the thing itself the the task itself is unbalanced right so you have like millions of records but mm. good records for a particular query is only a few out of those million so the the task itself is unbalanced so therefore when training uh, neural networks for search you actually have to for every positive sample you have to you know give up to like 20 25 uh, negative samples because you want to kind of tell the classifier train the classifier that this is what your sample space looks like right so i think uh, something similar is going on here as well because of the inherent sparsity of uh, graphs in general right you know one node is connected to very few other nodes right so you want to have a large number of negative samples to basically push the graph towards the sparsity um, uh, idea what is a negative sample you said a negative class is everything but the class that you want say yeah so in a in a binary classification step it would be you know what you don't want right what you don't so, want okay yeah but with your graph what you are getting is what you have right what you should get the positive samples you want the negative samples as well because otherwise you cannot create a classifier okay so a negative example. a negative sample is a node a, a, an edge that doesn't exist that doesn't exist potentially yes okay i so just some I, sort of it. the lesson yeah. was not that clear <laughs> at least parts 1 and 2 i mean i haven't even dug into 3 or 4 yet okay. yeah in in the context of what to fake though i mean because uh, language is so sparse all they do is be, basically they take the root word and any other word in the dictionary right in the vocabulary so okay. and it usually works out that this you know is not uh, you know uh, close to each other Yeah, so yeah, I think negative sample was the the high degrees, right? So the nodes with yeah, it was a uh, proportional to mm -hmm. uh, degree to the power three by four. So yeah, very uh, some heuristic they have used. So in there in that paper they have men they have uh, refer i mean they have mentioned the script gam model taking assuming corpus of words so i think uh, what you were saying was correct like it is coming from very much from the nlp uh, domain what in that seems to be the inspiration yeah deep work is definitely like an almost uh, carbon copy um but no to vec uh, balances between breadth first search and depth first search by using the p and q parameters so basically it uh, you know if you have high one or the other i forget which one it is uh, basically it will you know one will prioritize moving you know in a breadth first manner like same distance as the um, previous node from the original node whereas uh, the other parameter will emphasize how you know how deep you go right so uh, moving away from your original node so uh, you can you know control your random work in that way as well so how would you so tune those parameters p and q does it depend on your graph so it depends on your graph yes sparse then maybe you'd have a a higher q yeah or, or it also depends on you know what you you want your notion of similarity to be right mm -hmm. so it's like a hyperparameter and basically you know depending on your task you have to or choose what it is mm -hmm. um yeah i i forget the exact uh, you know which one to do for what uh, i just got from their uh, not to vex thing that um you know the p and q are hyperparameters 
uh, last uh, the times I've used uh, not to vec, I've just used the default uh, PQ parameters. So it just works. So. I was wondering how this could link up with reinforcement learning if anyone's got any ideas. Because um, there's this idea of transition probabilities. I guess the only thing here is that you don't have that controlled feedback. Mm. Um, yeah, I was wondering. So how would, oh, you mean like the random walk as a uh, reinforcement learning? The B and Q. I mean, the exploration and the exploitation, something that referring mm -hmm. to like P and Q, uh, is it something you're talking could, about? Yeah, well, it, it could be, but although, like you mentioned, uh, Amrinder mentioned that you know, uh, there is no feedback here, right, from the Oracle. So, yeah, but otherwise, uh, it does have a certain amount of exploitation, exploration ideas there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I guess in a lot of real world problems, you would have some control feedback, and then that feedback can actually sort of guide your search a bit more specifically, especially in complex problems. And, and also in dynamic um, problems, I think they mentioned something about, um, they, they assume uh, the transition probabilities to be uh, stationary. It will turn stationary over time, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, uh, but a lot of problems are dynamic, right? So the ground truth yes. is always yes. shifting. So reinforcement yeah. learning is better for that. For the more dynamic situations. Well, I think there are. Like, I think I'm not sure which lecture, but I think kind of later on in the course, they do talk about like graph the, a temporal dimension to it, like when stuff are changing and disappearing and appearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think you necessarily need something like reinforcement learning to, to handle it. Mm -hmm. It's just how you model the problem. Right. So, so like, would the adjacency metrics will be changing over time? I mean, it's just jumping a bit on the next part, but yeah, you mentioned like the temporal part, like the the graph changes with time. Yep. Uh, but, but I think the transition probabilities on the existing nodes wouldn't really um, exactly change. I'm sorry, on the existing edges. I think that's what makes reinforcement learning really difficult because uh, at t plus one, all your transition probabilities may have changed. So you have to sort of explore and, and adapt to that. So that's where the reinforcement right. part comes in. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's good to make connections, I guess, like with word to back uh, reinforcement learning. Mr. Anything else from this week you want to discuss? I don't think we really discussed much of the <laughs> uh, homework content that's there. The I, I don't know if people are planning on trying to work on it during the week. Uh, might be interesting to use the Slack a little bit to chat about it. Um, is is there a collab that people are collaborating on for any of these um, questions or just working on it? Not that I know of. I don't individually. Think yeah, I think most yeah, I think individual. So. I mean, kind of, I think like when you're working on your homework, it's better to try it yourself before looking at sure. anyone. Um, yeah. But I kind of, I mean, I'm, quite happy to share my solution to homework zero on Slack. Um, and then you can all point out where I make stupid mistakes. But um, yeah, we can I kind of like, I guess if one of us posts a solution, then we can all check against it and then see um, kind of where it doesn't match. And then we can discuss why it should work this way or the other way or the third way yeah. or whatever. So you've started working on the, all the 
HW1 questions already? HW0. Oh, okay. It's like kind of, I mean, the idea is to more or less follow the schedule already. I mean, there's yeah. no, I mean, if you are fast and just go ahead, but I mean, like, like it's not so bad for everybody if you share all your, like your solutions to homework one to four now. Yeah, sure. No, I, I was trying to understand where the, because I missed last week. I thought last week you started already, but this, this week people are just going through HW0. Is that the plan? That was the plan. So if you look at the spreadsheet again, like where it says, um, so kind of it says this week is actually zero. So kind of, I guess my idea is that we will have finished extra, extra zero by today or, or kind of, or no, or at least like have attempted and then we can discuss it, any problems and the session. Right. Um, but I mean like, all these things are optional and you can go as slow or fast as you want. Um, it's just there for like guide really. Well, if there's nothing else, I guess we can end the meeting. Um, hope everyone have a good week ahead. Okay, we'll try to do more in Slack. I, I like the concept of doing things together, but I, I'm not quite sure of the, the tooling and the mechanisms for that. So. It can definitely start a conversation, um, like get a conversation going in Slack channel. Yeah, yeah. Just keep posing questions. Yeah. <laughs> cool. See you next week. Okay. Yeah, right thank you. Good luck there yeah. in the house. Thank you. Yeah, in, in two weeks, I'll give you a tour. It's gonna to be beautiful. Nice. Wow. That's a lot of work in two weeks, my friend. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm more like the foreman. You know? Still, that's still a lot of work. Good luck. It is. Man. It is a lot of work. All right. Take care. Yep. All right. All right. Cheers. Cool. Right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.